Clark College, Intech 221, Introduction to Networks. This is Chapter 3, Network Protocols and Communications, and I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. Today, we hope to help students be able to explain how rules are used to facilitate communication, explain the role of protocols and standards, organizations, in facilitating the interoperability in network communications. Also explain how devices on a LAN access resources in a small to medium-sized business network. Let's get started. What is communication? We start by looking at human communication. In any kind of communication, there's a message, something we want to communicate. So that's one part of communication is the message. A message has a source and a destination. And you see that in the graphic. We then need a signal, that's a transmitter and receiver. We need to, a way to send and receive the message. So that's the signal. The third piece is the medium. We need a transmission medium. For networking, that's going to be fiber optic, copper plant, or a radio frequency. In human communication, we often send our signal through the air, or it could it would be called verbal communication, or we write it down, which would be written communication, or we may choose electronic communication, a text message, an email, that sort of thing. Establishing rules. All communication needs a set of rules, and those rules have to be followed by both the um, sender and receiver of the message. So we need a set of rules that we agree to. Typically, then, in human communication, we start with a greeting like, hello, or can I talk to you for a moment? We have some type of opening. Before we send the message, we usually have a greeting. Also, when we're done sending the message, we often have a, a closing where we say, okay, well, that's all, or I have to get going now. So we usually don't just walk away when we said what we want. We usually end the communication. So we usually have a start and an end, and then a middle where we actually say what we want. Other rules, we usually have to identify who the message is from and who it's to. We need to know who the sender and receiver are. We have to agree on the method of communicating. Is it going to be face-to-face, -face, a telephone, a letter, or a photograph? We have to have a common language and grammar to our communication. We have to agree on the speed and timing of delivery. We also usually have a system for confirmation and acknowledgement. In a, a common human message, we might go, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, okay, I got that, yep. Or uh, we might say, I'm confused. Can you repeat that? Things like that would uh, would indicate we're not confirming or acknowledging. We need a resend of that part of the message. So that's part of the rules that we've just internalized as humans. Computers, same as humans, need to have a common set of rules. We call these rules a protocol. And so we need to have a common protocol that the sender and receiver use when they're sending a message. So messages have to be encoded. For instance, when you have a message to send, you have to encode, encode that into um, voice. So you have to move your lips and your tongue, and you have to push air out of your mouth. And that air movement, that is the encoding of what you want to say. What you want to say is in your brain, and you need to get that out. Or if you're not verbalizing your message, you need to get it out through pen and paper. You have to grab a pencil or a pen, and you have to, you have to move your muscles and be able to draw characters which are the encoding of the message. We also have to encapsulate the message and give it a certain format. So for example, if you were to send a letter, it would have a sender and a recipient field that you would fill in. Uh, the letter would always open with a salutation or greeting like hello. You would have to have some content to the message and usually some kind of closing like sincerely, respectfully, that kind of thing. Message size. There can be restrictions on how big the message can be in an individual piece before you have to cut it up we're called segmentation. You may have to if you have a very long message. Think of this in human conversation. When I talk to a student, I might tell them I have five minutes. Um, and I will ask them if they needed to talk to me 
will they be able to complete their message in the time we have? If not, they may need to segment the message. They may, need, they may need to give me just the highlights now and schedule a time to send the rest of their uh, communication later. And that is called a segment or segmenting the message. And it's commonly done on a network. We don't allow devices to just talk and talk and talk. They're restricted to a certain size or time frame, and they then can send another piece of their message in the next block or time frame. So we talked a little about timing and timing will have to do with how you access the network and flow control, who gets to go and when, and how long you wait for a response from who you sent the message to um, before you decide to say your message again. Like if I'm on the phone talking to someone and I say something and they don't say anything, I'm gonna say, hello, yeah? Oh, you're still there? Yeah, did you hear what I said? So I have to wait for a response timeout. I wouldn't necessarily do that all the time. That would be annoying. But if I haven't heard from the receiver for a while, if they haven't acknowledged what I'm saying, I may have to check to make sure they're still receiving. We also would look at different delivery options. In networking, we have three methods that we can send a message. A unicast, which is a one-to-one -one message. That's coming from one sender to one receiver. We also have a multicast, that's one to many. An analogy for human beings would be like a radio station. Anyone who tunes in would be part of that multicast. So that's a group of folks that want to hear the message. Uh, another analogy might be students that stay after the class. After the class time is over, the students that stay and want to talk to the teacher and they all want to hear more about the topic that was covered that day, that would be a multicast. It's only for those that are interested. A broadcast is a one to everyone. It's a one to all. And that message then is be like what comes out of uh, the PA in an airport, the announcements that everyone hears. We already talked about how rules are essentially the um, protocols that we use. So rules are protocols. So a protocol suite is a set of rules that provides a common language for sending messages. They will define how the message is formatted or structured, the process by which the devices will share the information, and how and when there'll be air checking, and when will we know that the communication is over? How do we hang up? So basically how to start, how to establish the communication, how what the rules that govern air checking during the communication, and then how do we terminate the communication. So the three main parts of a protocol. Some of the common protocols that you might know are HTTP, every time you look at a web page, you'll notice in the uh, address bar in the upper left corner, it will always start as HTTP. That is identifying the protocol that is delivering that web page. Web pages are sent using HTTP. Interestingly, they're written in HTML, hypertext markup language. So if you were programming a web page, you would write the page in HTML, but is delivered across the internet using the protocol HTTP. That's what actually gets it from point A to point B. We also use TCP, which is another protocol that helps get all of our communications from where they are at to where they're going. Another protocol that helps deliver messages is internet protocol. That's the naming protocol that gives unique numbers to every device on our network. We have a variety of other protocols as well, and in fact, you might find that there are anywhere from three to a dozen different protocols involved in sending a single package of information across the network. They work in a layered model, so different protocols are working um, with different devices to ensure your message gets across the network. These are those layers. You can see layers one through seven in the far left column. And then you can see the different protocols that operate on each layer. And so if you were looking at this, you can see that in the blue row at the top, I might, for instance, choose HTTP. 
And then that protocol will need the help of either TCP or UDP to get to its destination, which will in turn need the help of IPv4 or IPv6 or ICMP, which in turn will need the help of a media specific protocol at the bottom like Ethernet or Frame Relay or PPP or some others. This is a look at all kinds of different networks linked together. This is actually an early drawing of the internet. So when the internet was laid out, this is one of the early drawings of all the connections between the different endpoints on the internet. This is a look at the layered model of protocols and how they work together stacking on top of each other to provide delivery service for your information. Some of the standards organizations that help make this all work are here on this page. IEEE, IA, TIA, ICANN, ITU, IETF, and IANA. There are many others, but these are the largest international organizations that we rely on to set standards. The reason that standards are so important is they set the rules for these protocols and allow that they interoperate between vendors, ensuring that the same protocol works between Microsoft and Apple and Google and any of the companies that are building software and equipment for our industry when they implement an industry standard protocol that is implemented in a compatible way across the industry, ensuring interoperability and communication. So these are some of the open standards organizations that create protocols that anyone can use. This is a hierarchical diagram to show how they interrelate the different standards organizations. They don't compete, they work on different types of protocols and in different ways. And you can see that the different organizations have different breadth. So some are interested in just big, large, loose structures, kind of setting some guidelines. And then different organizations drill down on those guidelines, adding more specificity until they become specific criteria, which we would know as a protocol, as a specific protocol or set of rules. IEEE is a organization that is the International Electronic Engineers and they're all over the world in 160 countries and they're made up of all the major um, companies from Intel to Cisco to Microsoft. Um, pretty much every major company is a, a contributing member to IEEE. They have a wealth of journals and magazines available. Their website has a, a lot of valuable information and they have created most of the protocols that you know of that you use on the internet, two of them are listed here. 8023 is what we know as Ethernet, and 802.11 is wireless Ethernet. The ISO is one of those big overreaching standards organizations that doesn't set specific protocol standards. They come up with the big ideas, kind of the umbrella concepts and one of those is called the OSI model. The ISO organization created the OSI model and the OSI model is a seven layer model shown here that helps us categorize and relate the various protocols that we use in our industry by knowing what they work with. And so it's a way to look at all of networking and um, categorize it into the types of um, communications that are going on. Other standards organizations, IA, they deal with just the electronics and they work, they actually co-publish all of their standards with TIA, which deals with more of the telecommunications. So IA, TIA jointly release their standards. And you can see others here. The benefits of using a layered model. Well, the main benefits of a layered model is they help make sense out of an otherwise very complex and chaotic landscape of networking. Using a layered model, it allows us to categorize and make sense out of 
all of the various protocols of which there are thousands of protocols out there and we're evolving our network so rapidly with new technologies a layered model allows things to evolve more quickly in a more organized way and facilitates being able to communicate about those changes so this is called the reference model the osi model is the reference model or master model that we all refer to when we're talking about networking a more abbreviated model, a working model, is the TCP IP model. It's a four layer model that actually is derived from the seven layer model. Let me go back a slide and you can see the four layers colored here, the green, the yellow, right? You can see how it kind of goes down. So they break it into layers based on data, segments, packets, frames. So the four layer model is data segments, packets, frames, and you can see that here. They rename many of the layers, but it's a four layer model that covers the exact same categories. So you basically put all of networking into four categories instead of seven. So we have two different ways that we can conceptualize networking. Here is how the two models relate to one another. The TCP IP model simply comes directly out of the OSI model and represents the top three layers as a single layer and the bottom two layers as a single layer and leaves the middle layers untouched. Communicating the message. So we already talked about segmentation. If you have a very long message, it will have to be cut up into segments and sent in discrete pieces. A benefit of doing that is it allows more devices to communicate on the network. If you've ever driven on a road with a large truck or many large trucks, you have the idea of how difficult it is to navigate a roadway with those large vehicles. Or if you are ever in a conversation with someone who talks on and on and on and doesn't take a breath, you never get a chance to speak yourself. If messages are segmented to a maximum length, they ensure that more devices can speak on the network and get their messages across as well. It also increases the reliability of networks because small segments that get damaged or lost can more easily be resent than a large segment that gets damaged or lost. The disadvantage of segmenting your messages is it increases the complexity because you have to reassemble them on the receiving end. We use the term PDU or protocol data unit to refer to the concept of encapsulation. So when a message is encapsulated, we call that a PDU, protocol data unit. That's an encapsulated message. It could be a segment. A segment is a PDU or a packet. A segment is the first encapsulation of data when we take a stream of data and cut it into pieces. They are packaged in what's called a segment. The segments are then packaged in packets, which are then packaged in frames, and finally sent out on the wire. This is that encapsulation process. Once it's fully encapsulated, the message is sent out on the wire as a string of ones and zeros. It may be moving as light pulses down fiber optic cables or electrical pulses down a copper cable or even radio frequency moving down, cycling, if you will, in hertz, moving across the air. On the other end, then, it has to be de-encapsulated. Once the ones and zeros are received, they have to be returned back to the data, the message that was sent. And that is done by removing the various layers of encapsulation that have been applied to them. So these are the different layers of encapsulation. We have a physical layer, which would be the light or the electrical or the radio frequency. Then we have the data link layer, which is setting the local source and destination addresses of the physical devices. We have a network layer providing global addressing in a, in a um, logical sense. And then we have the segmentation, which puts the segments back together using the um, numbers that are contained in those segments. So looking at some of these, we have two addressing layers. We address things twice. They're addressed on the packet and they're addressed on the frame as shown here. 
these addresses don't always match up. The addresses on the bottom are the local addresses. Those would be the addresses, the to and from addresses as a package moves across the local network. They only exist from the local to and from. If you were, for instance, sending something to Yahoo on the internet, it would first have to go to your gateway router. So the local addressing would be from you to your gateway router. The global addressing, the network address, would be from you to Yahoo. And that's how the two address um, groupings correlate. It would look something like this. You have in the online curriculum for this course many animated illustrations and activities that help you understand both physical and logical addressing as well as several lab activities. So it won't take your time here going over the difference between physical and logical addressing. The default gateway, remember, is the doorway out of your local network. A default gateway or doorway is almost always your router and it would be the router that leads out of your local network as shown here. R1 and R2 are both default gateways. But PC1 and PC2 cannot use R2 as their default gateway because it is not connected to their local room, to their local network. Just like if you're in a room, you can't use a door down the hall to get out of the room you're in. You must use a door that's connected to the room you are in. In the case of PC1 and PC2 in this illustration, router 1 is the gateway out of this room. So this is how they would communicate. Notice that a message going from PC1 going to the web server is going to go first to router one and you can see that in the data link frame header that its source is AAAAA which is PC1 and its destination is 11111 which is router one. So that's that local source and destination. That frame header, that physical addressing ensures that the message arrives at router 1. Router 1 will strip that off and then read the packet source and destination and see that the message is coming from PC1. You can see that addressing matches PC1 and it is destined to the web server. The router using its special tables called a routing table is able to determine a path to that destination and forward it on much like a postal employee would do when they received your mail or your envelope. It is your job to get the envelope in the mailbox. Much like PC1 is trying to get the message to router one so that router one can get it the rest of the way to where it needs to go. We can use a program which is a network analysis tool called Wireshark which is free we have it loaded on all of the computers in our lab and you could have it installed at your home if you wanted to download it. Allows you to look at a live network and see packages as they move. The messages are then broken into all of the segments and frames and packets as you can see here and using Wireshark it allows us to click on a message and look at the different encapsulations and read who they're from and who they're to. In this chapter we took a look at data networks as systems of end devices with intermediary devices, that would be routers and switches, acting as the uh, conduit to make these communications occur. And we talked about how devices have to comply with common rules that we call protocols so that the communication can occur. And that these protocols are created and maintained by standards organizations that ensure interoperability and um, evolution of the protocol so that it is supported by, by all systems. We have some more summary here. The data is passed down a hierarchical stack, if you will, like the OSI model or the TCP IP model. And so data moves down and is uh, segmented and encapsulated. And then after it is received, data moves back up and is de-encapsulated and reassembled. 
we generically call this process of encapsulation PDUs. PDU is the layer specific encapsulation. So a data segment packet or frame or bits could be a PDU. A PDU is a generic term for encapsulation.